Welcome to St. Andrew's United Church. We're so happy to have you with us, whether you're part of our St. Andrew's family or whether you are joining us just for today. Our worship service today for July 26th is going to focus on pride. And I am Shannon McLean, the minister here at St. Andrew's. I would like to start by reading you a little bit that is written on our United Church of Canada website. It says, the United Church affirms that gender and sexuality are gifts of God. We invite all people of faith to celebrate the life and ministry of the LGBTQIA plus and two-spirited people across the church and beyond. Pride Sunday is a time to publicly celebrate the rainbow people of God. Today we intentionally affirm people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. And we make explicit our acceptance and kindness for all. St. Andrew's United Church here in Truro is an affirming congregation. All are welcome here. Now I have to take a moment by making a retraction from my last week's service. I made a statement in error. I found out when my mother called me after the service to say, the baptismal cake was certainly not store-bought. It is true, it was not made by her. However, it was homemade by somebody else for the occasion. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> we are in the Peace and Friendship Treaties territory. And the land on which this church sits, and the land on which we gather and live and worship, is the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq and the Wabanaki Confederacy people. May we live with respect on this land, and in peace and friendship with its people. Today I call you to worship by hearing our first creation story as adapted from Genesis 1. We read that God created the heavens and the earth, the light, the waters and the land, plants, trees of every kind, the sun and the moon, and God saw that it was good. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind in which the water swarms. God created these, but also this. Some of the creatures seemed friendly and some evoked fear. There were sea creatures of all sorts and God blessed them. And God created every winged bird of every kind. Some were majestic. And others were, well, not so majestic. And God blessed them and saw that it was good. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals, wild animals of the earth of every kind. And God blessed them and saw it was good. Then God said, let us create humankind in our image according to our likeness. God, who is love, created us from love. And we, made in the image of God, are called to reflect that love in the world. We can spread this love in romantic relationships, 
if two people of any gender, any sexuality, any race, any disability, any ability, any culture, love each other, God blesses them and says, it is good. God created us to mirror love through our families. Love is the glue that holds together families. Families that come in all sizes and all shapes. God looks at all families that are built on the foundation of love and blesses them and says, it is good. We also reflect this love of God through our relationships with friends and our connection to all of God's children. We remember and we hold in our hearts the words of Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. God saw everything that God had made and indeed, it was very good. Let us worship God. You might notice today that our communion table looks a little bit more colorful than usual. The rainbow, it has become a, prim, a, a symbol of pride. And it's also a meaningful symbol in our, in our faith lives as well, in our faith story. Because the rainbow reminds us of God's covenant, of God's eternal, unconditional love. The rainbow reminds us that we are not alone, that God is always with us. The rainbow reminds us of the beauty of God's wonderfully diverse, created world. Rainbows often come after the storm. They are a promise of better times to come. While we long to get to those better times, we must acknowledge that there have been and will continue to be storms as well. Anne Weems speaks of this beautifully in her poem called, I'll Write a Rainbow for You. If I could, I'd write a rainbow for you and splash it with all the colors of God so that each new God's morning, your eyes would open first to hope and promise. If I could, I'd wipe away your tears and hold you close forever in shalom. But God never promised I could write a rainbow, never promised I could suffer for you, only promised that I could love you, and that I do. As we light the Christ candle, we are reminded that even in the darkest of times, it only takes one single flame to shatter the darkness. And that light is Christ. Let us pray. God, open our hearts that we might hear your voice in music, in words, and in images. Soften our hearts so that we might be transformed by what we hear. Amen.
Well, I think it's time for a story. What do you think? I really love stories. I hope you do too. I really like stories that tell me something that I didn't know before or teach me something new. And I don't know if any of you have heard of the story of the little boy who cried wolf, but it's a really great story. If you don't know it, ask somebody to tell you. But it's a story about a little boy who pretends that he's in danger when he isn't. And he lies so many times that when he actually is in danger, nobody comes to help him anymore. And in our story of the boy who cried wolf, uh, it's a little boy and a wolf. But actually in Kenya, I've heard that the story is about a lion and a child. And so I don't think it really matters because it's not teaching us something about wolves. It's teaching us something about telling the truth. It kind of is a story that has a message. And Jesus told stories like this too. Stories that helped us to learn really important points. Usually they were things that were pretty hard to understand. And so Jesus would tell it in a way that maybe people could understand better. But do you remember the story I told a couple weeks ago about the elephant? There are no stories that we can tell that really can explain everything about God. And there also are no stories that we can tell that really explain everything about the kingdom of God. And so this is one of the stories that Jesus told to help people understand. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in their field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can come and make nests in its branches. Weird, right? It's a story about mustard, but it's not really about mustard. It's about seeds, but it's not really about seeds or how to garden. It's a way for us to learn something about God's kingdom. What do you think it means, I wonder? If you were here, I'd be able to ask you, but I'll just have to imagine what you're saying. <laughs> So I decided for today, I'm going to make up a new parable that might teach us something about the kingdom of God. Okay. I think that the kingdom of God is like these peppermints. Do you see these peppermints? Woo. They're just ordinary 
white, small peppermints. Nothing extraordinary about them at all. But when they get added to a bottle of Diet Coke, everything changes and nothing will be the same again. So why don't we do a little experiment? Let's go outside and let's see what happens in my parable of the kingdom of God is like these peppermints and Diet Coke. Okay, let's see what happens when we add the Mentos to the Diet Coke. Woo! <laughs> something pretty small and ordinary became something big and dramatic and will never be the same again. There is no story that can really tell us everything about God. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And there's no story that really could tell us everything about the kingdom of God. But every one of these stories tells us a little bit about it. And for me, the Mentos and the Diet Coke, it reminds me that something very small, like the Mentos or a mustard seed, can have this huge effect. And for us, when we are filled with the love of God, two really big things can happen. One of the things that can happen is we're changed forever once we know that we are completely loved just the way we are. And the other one is that the love grows and grows and grows within us until we can't help but share it with everybody who we meet. What do you think the parable means? Okay, let's go and hear some more of Jesus's parables. Today our scripture reading is from Matthew, and I would like to thank our guest readers who are joining us today. Thank you to April Hart, who is the new student minister at Bible Hill and Valley Greenfield, and also to Reverend Philip Kennedy, who is the new minister at the Bible Hill and Hilden Pastoral Charges. So thank you for reading for us today. What we know at this point in the story is that the Jewish people have been waiting a long time for a king, a king to set them free from oppression under which they lived. For most of them, this vision of a king included armies and swords, extravagance and royalty. And Jesus did not fit this image of their savior. The people were confused. So Jesus tried explaining to them what the kingdom of God was like. And now reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 to 33, and 44 to 52. The parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in their field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The Parable of the Yeast The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Three Parables The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Of finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? They answered, yes. Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. 
In this reading, may we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Empowering God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts bring us closer to you, O God. Amen. So one of the ways that the text that you just heard, and particularly the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast are often explored, is by talking about how something so small, so completely unexceptional, like a seed or like yeast, can grow into something huge, something remarkable. And we did explore that idea a little bit in our story time. But there's something else that ties together these parables that I'd like to talk about today. In one way or another, they are all talking about things that are hidden, unexpected things. So we have a small bit of yeast that was hidden in mountains of flour. This was enough flour to make about 100 loaves of bread. A valuable treasure that was hidden in a neighbor's yard. One exquisite pearl that was discovered hidden in, in a sea of ordinary pearls. Good fish hidden among the rest of the catch. And even the mustard seed was probably hidden. Because you see, at the time when Jesus told this parable, planting mustard was illegal. Because mustard is a weed. It is invasive, it is unpredictable, it spreads like wildfire and could quickly take over a whole garden. So the Jewish people at the time were prohibited from planting it. And a mustard seed, it is so small that it could easily hide among the good seeds and be unexpectedly, unexpectedly planted with the rest of the seeds by the gardener. So then the gardener would be very surprised when this fast-growing, wildly spreading bush starts to take over the whole garden. So do you think that maybe Jesus was saying the kingdom of heaven is less about the expected, less about boundaries, clear lines, and order? Could Jesus have meant that it is more about unbounded spontaneity, surprise, and the unexpected? Do you think the kingdom of heaven is like perfectly identical rows of an expected crop, predictable and unsurprising? No, I think he's reminding us it is more like the unexpected, like when weeds break in, like a hidden treasure, like the unexpected and extraordinary effect a small bit of yeast has in a mountain of flour. But sometimes we are guilty of wanting the predictable, of building the walls, of believing that there are inarguable boundaries. We find comfort in dividing the good from the bad. But last week in our parable, which was about dividing the bad weeds from the good wheat, what we found is that this seemingly easy task is much harder than it first appears. If you want to hear more on that sermon, you can still join us for worship on our website. Also, sometimes I think we have to confess we are more comfortable with a tame Jesus. We want a savior who was nice, who did kind things, who was the kind of guy that everybody loved. When I think of this domesticated Jesus, I'm reminded of something that happened a couple years ago as a student minister. I, I was preached these two sermons in pretty close proximity. And the first one asked a very hard question. It said, which side of the protest for social justice would you have been standing on? And the other contrasted Jesus's Palm Sunday parade with the one Caesar would have had on that same day, 
reinforcing the power held by the Roman Empire. One man in the congregation after my second sermon turned around to the woman behind him and he said, wow, what a sermon. Shannon is doing a great job. And she responded, well, is she always going to be this political? And he said, well, Jesus was pretty political. To which she indignantly replied, he certainly was not. I actually cherish that conversation. I know she did not like my preaching, so it wasn't meant to be a compliment. But if my sermon started to help some people get Jesus out of the, he's such a nice guy category and moved into the table flipping, Pharisee debating, tradition testing, weed planting, empire protesting rebel that he was, I felt like I was doing something right. <laughs> so is the kingdom of God like this garden? A garden that has been diligently tended to keep out the unwanted weeds, perfectly organized and exactly as we expect it to be? I think sometimes we do try to make the kingdom of God like this, neat, tidy, expect it. We put up walls and decide who is in and who is out. For a long time, the church said that LGBTQ2 plus people were out. We said indigenous people, unless they became like us, were out. We said people with disabilities, unless they could act like us, were out. The boundaries were clear. Only good Christians, who were like the rest of us, were allowed in. And the others, they either had to change to be like us, or they were out. The hurt, the trauma that resulted from these boundaries rings in our sanctuary still. We have so much work to do to reconcile these relationships. The walls we built not only damaged the people who we excluded, but they prevented the kingdom of God from spreading like wildfire and blocked the spirit from breaking through in unexpected ways. Jesus was saying that, the, that God's kingdom, the kingdom that we're striving for on earth, is more like the beauty that emerges when there are no boundaries, when there is diversity, when things are allowed to grow as they were made to grow. Jesus is saying that we need to stop building walls because we aren't the gardeners. And we need to be open to the unexpected, unexpected, surprising way God and God's kingdom breaks through. May it be so. And now please join me in singing one of my very most favorite hymns, My Love Colors Outside the Lines.
let us join together in prayer through images, music, and words, including those written by Alidia Smith for Pride Sunday. Let us pray. God who has created and is creating. We know you are with us when we face life's storms. We know people of every sexual orientation, gender expression and gender identity have the right to live with dignity and without persecution or discrimination. Yet we know this isn't always so. We remember in our prayers, God, LGBTQ plus people who have been murdered and tortured because of who they are. We remember them and the people who love them. We remember in our prayers, LGBTQ plus refugees from around the world seeking safety and sanctuary. We remember them and the people who welcome them. We remember in our prayers trans and gender diverse people who are targeted victims of hate crimes and assaults. We remember them and the people who love them. For LGBTQ plus people whose dignity and self-esteem have been eroded by hateful systems and structures. We remember them and seek to be the people who love more fully. Help us to remember, God, that individually, we each uniquely reflect your glory and express your love. But anti-gay violence, homophobia, and transphobia have blocked many from recognizing your beauty in the world. We hold up these prayers and all other things that weigh heavily on our hearts within this moment of sacred silence. God, we also pray prayers of thanks for your technicolored creation, which often brings rainbows after the storm. For the red strawberries that taste like summer and all the foods that the farmers grow nourishing our bodies. For orange sunsets and the beauty of an ever-changing sky. For the yellow honeybee who reminds us how connected you made us all, God. For the greens in your created world, including the greens of our yards and gardens, where we gather with friends and families. For the blue ocean and lakes and the feeling of a refreshing dip on a hot day. For purple balloons reminding us of parties and celebrations. For each milestone in our lives, we give thanks. And now God, we take time to say aloud or hold in our hearts our individual prayers of thanksgiving. God, may we dedicate ourselves to building bridges of love and hope where harmful divisions have been made, making equity and equality for all people our goal while working continually for justice so that everyone can live fully in your love. Accept our humble prayers, God, as we join together in saying the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to say, Our Mother and Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. One of the ways that we can show God our gratitude is by freely offering what we have to support God's mission in the world. One way to do this is by offering our financial gifts. And that is something that you can do to support the ministry of St. Andrews by e-transfer or par or leaving a donation in the, in the mailbox. Another way that we do it is by offering our gifts of time and talent. And as you can imagine, it does take many people to offer their gifts of time and talent to make a worship service like this happen. And we sure appreciate that. These COVID times are challenging for many. And if you happen to find yourself in a time of need, please reach out to us and we will do what we can to help. If we share what we have, then there will be enough for all. One of the ways that this community of St. Andrews has participated in God's mission in the world is by becoming an affirming congregation. Joanna will tell us a little bit more about that. Today's Minute for Mission is a little different. I'm going to speak about an initiative we've been working on here at home. For over a decade, becoming an inclusive and welcoming church has been a mission of St. Andrews. We strive to make our congregation and church services welcoming, as well as our building and events. The Affirming Committee was created in 2007 with the pur purpose of exploring the requirements for and implications of becoming an affirming ministry. According to the Affirm United website, every faith community or organization that is an affirming ministry declares itself to be fully inclusive of people of all sexual orientations and gender identities and they back their words up with action. In 2009, after two years of study, discussion, storytelling, and prayer, St. Andrews earned the designation of being an affirming ministry, a designation we are proud of and strive to live up to in all the work that we do. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, and other members of the LGBTQ plus community have traditionally been excluded from and even prosecuted by the Christian church. For many members of this community, the church is very much an unwelcoming place and a place of shame and judgment. For this reason, our congregation, with the leadership of the Affirming Committee, now called the Open Hearts and Minds Committee, has tried to follow the PI approach by being public, intentional, and explicit about our inclusivity. While our hearts may be open, it needs to be clear in our media, our signage, our advertisements, our facility, and in all the ways we connect to the community that we not only welcome LGBTQ plus folks to our church, but we recognize the unique ways they can benefit and contribute to our community, and we view them as valued members of God's family. This is why we celebrate Pi Day every March, and why we held a 10-year anniversary celebration of St. Andrews being an affirming congregation last October, to be public and explicit about our commitment to creating a safe and welcoming space for LGBTQ plus people. This is why we march in the, in the Pride Parade, put the Pride flag on our sign out front, and why the search committee actively sought a minister with experience serving a diverse and inclusive congregation. Today, the Open Hearts and Minds Committee aims to make St. Andrews welcoming to all marginalized communities, including people of color, indigenous people, differently abled people, homeless people, people who are mentally ill or struggling with addiction, and other groups that have been disenfranchised in the church and in our society. Although we've made some excellent progress, there is still work left to do to make sure that people from all of these groups truly feel welcomed at St. Andrews. It will require education, adaptation, meaningful consultation with these communities, planning, and real action. For example, to make our church more welcoming to trans and non-binary folks, we are planning to hold workshops about language around gender to help congregation members use the correct language when referring to trans and non-binary people, as well as to teach us how and when to ask for preferred pronouns. 
This Pride Sunday, we should remember that there are still gay, lesbian, queer, trans, bisexual, and non-binary folks all around the world who are bullied, abused, punished, imprisoned, humiliated, tortured, and killed just for being themselves. At St. Andrew's, we follow the teachings of Jesus, which tell us to treat one another as we would like to be treated, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We believe in equality, in equity, and in helping those who do not have the privileges or the advantages that each of us may have had. To the world and be a rainbow, a sign of covenant and peace. Splash your hues across the sky. Paint the world in colors, proud and bold and free. And may God keep you and bless you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.